Think Again TV is produced by Center for Inquiry, Canada's premier venue for secular humanists, atheists, skeptics, and free thinkers. Good morning, everyone. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name's Jamie Warner. I'm the executive director of Center for Inquiry Toronto, and I'd like to give you a very warm welcome to our brunch with Richard Dawkins and Lawrence Krauss. Thank you so much for coming. Center for Inquiry is a uh, charity that works very hard to promote science and reason um, and also fun. Um, what we're trying to do is, uh, with this brunch, is one, get you guys closer to some people who do a really fantastic job at communicating science and secularism, um, but also people who do it in a very engaging and entertaining way. Um, and so those little goodie bags are trying to tell you that uh, uh, science and secularism can be fun, it should be fun, and we're hoping that today you'll get a sense of that as well from our organization as well is from the speaker. So what we're going to be doing um, uh, today is uh, open up uh, for questions for uh, uh, Dr. Krauss and uh, Professor Dawkins. Um, and first off, we're just going to have a, a brief introduction and a few remarks from our uh, development director, uh, Justin Troche. So I'd like to welcome uh, Justin up, who's going to be uh, starting off with a little introduction for Dr. Krauss. Uh, unfortunately, he has to leave at about 10.15, so we're going to try and make sure that we get all of your questions for Dr. Krauss answered first. And then we'll move on and, and we'll have a nice little chat with uh, Professor Dawkins. So, uh, Justin, if you take it away, please. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. In the interest of time, I'm just going to uh, dive right into this. Uh, we're joined by two of the brightest lights of our movement this morning, Professor Richard Dawkins and Professor Lawrence Krauss. Uh, Professor Dawkins, I will provide a more formal introduction to uh, just after uh, Professor Krauss has a chance to take your questions. Uh, Lawrence Krauss is uh, being welcomed home today. Uh, he actually grew up in Toronto and studied at Carleton. He's the Foundation Professor of the School of Earth and Space Exploration and the Director of the Origins Institute at Arizona State University. He was Barack Obama's 2008 Presidential Campaign Science Policy Committee member and received awards, has received awards from the American Physical Society, the American Association of Physics Teachers, and the American Institute of Physics. He's the author of several books, including The Physics of Star Trek, Quantum Man, a biography of Richard Feynman, and most recently, A Universe from Nothing, Why There is Something Rather Than Nothing. Both of our distinguished guests are close friends of the Center for Inquiry, and so it is real pleasure and honor to ask you to help me to welcome uh, both of our guests, but in particular, we're going to be speaking firstly with Professor Lawrence Krauss. Well, thank you all for coming out this morning. It's, uh, it's a really kind of amazing given the short notice we gave Jamie. Um, that's my fault. I, I, was, uh, I wasn't certain of our schedule and, and um, kept saying, yeah, it sounds like a good idea, maybe. Um, but I'm really happy to be, to be here with Richard and, and all of you. And uh, uh, it's really quite amazing, actually, that it all happened and you managed to find a room in the hotel and everything. I, um, I, uh, I think I'm primarily going to answer questions. I, um, I, I think that uh, we've been talking a lot. Uh, I don't know if any of you got to see the movie. I hope if you didn't, you get to. Uh, there are now four showings, so hopefully that, that you can get into, into one of them. And, uh, and we, were, we, we had a very good interview yesterday on TVO with, with Steve uh, Pakin, who, who's a very good interviewer, and I think both Richard and I really enjoyed that. And it, and it, and it brought out some different things that I don't think uh, have been discussed uh, a lot. And um, uh, my, I think the thing that, that, that intrigued me the most uh, and that I've been thinking about lately is this notion of spirituality, which we were talked about, uh, uh, we were talking about, and, and the need to not just to point out the spirituality of science, but the need to uh, to to point out that this vague notion of spirituality is exactly that, and that what it rep and what it represents and what it doesn't represent, representing in some sense for many people the need to to ma to maintain what they get from religion without the religion, uh, but on the other hand, the worry that it, that 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 um, that it's so well defined that it really doesn't provide what people really need, and, and it's a word that without meaning, in large sense, and and uh, and that I think we need to replace the, that 
that word with things that have more meaning in a real way. And I'm, so I've been thinking about that a lot lately and, and uh, planning to write about it. And so um, I'm glad it came up in the interview and uh, I'm glad both Richard and I got to talk about it uh, uh, because I do think that th there's a two-sided coin here. One, the fact that, that the conventional wisdom is that science takes away rather than adding to people's lives. It takes away all the good things and all those good things are provided by religion. And, um, and secondly, that, 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 that somehow um, this need for something more requires, cannot be satisfied by the real world is, is, um, is, is very disturbing and I think obviously very erroneous. And uh, I think we, we, I've been thinking about ways to try and um, conquer that notion and, uh, and try and come up with, with, with something better. So stay tuned and I'll be writing on that. Uh, I think that's all I'm going to say, and I'd be happy to answer questions uh, for a while, and, uh, and then, um, then turn it over to Richard, who will be here for the next two or three hours. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> we have him chained underneath the table. Yeah, that's right. So I'll just take him, I guess, yeah? Um, reading about the fact that it takes both, and you, uh, you said that you didn't expect it to actually be found. I was hoping it wouldn't be. Yeah, I was sure what didn't exist, actually. And, and, and Hawking said the same thing. He didn't expect to find it. He even put money on it. Um, yeah, he does that a lot. Yeah. <laughs> uh, is there anything that, since that has been found, now you've changed your mind about other things, that maybe it's possible that they'll find things that you previously... It's, it's changed my thinking a lot. I, this notion, I wish I had time to really go into a, a proper discussion of the Higgs boson, because it's a remarkable... It's a remarkable cap of a 50-year intellectual journey. So one of the greatest, next to perhaps Darwin's discovery of, of evolution, I guess is a way to put it. Next to that, I, I think in, in, the modern, in modern times, it's the most amazing intellectual journey humans have ever taken, and, and it should be celebrated as such. And, and, it, and uh, I, I really love talking about it because it, it, it weaves in all of modern science, I thought of write about writing a, a longer, I've written a, a, a bunch of short pieces about it, maybe I'll write a long piece, but in any case, it really is this capstone of this, of, of, of this journey that's involved theorists and experimentalists for 50 years, and it really is amazing. As a theoretical physicist, the, perhaps the, the most daunting thing in the world is to be sitting, some, for my case, at night, that's, that's the only time I can seem to work, uh, is, um, and, and to think for a moment that something you're working on is actually, that the universe actually obeys what you're talking about is very scary. And, um, and it, the good news is most of the time it doesn't. Most of the time you're wrong, so that's easy. Uh, but um, in this case, this notion that this beautiful edifice, the standard model of particle physics, fit together beautifully, but there was a missing piece. And, um, the missing piece was that the, the, the well, I'll give you, a, I can't help, I got, I'm, a, I'm a teacher, I got to, I'll give you a two-minute discussion of it. I can't, I can't talk about important is without laying the, the groundwork. Uh, so the short version of this would be that, so there are these two forces of nature that are very, very different, the weak force and the electromagnetic force, and they're different as different can be. One, one's long range, one's, one exists only over the size of the nucleus, and and one is very strong, one is very weak. Neutrinos that experience just the weak force. There are 10,000 billion neutrinos going through every square centimeter of your body every second. And during the day, they're coming down from above. And at night, when you're sleeping, they're coming right up through the earth. They don't interact. They go right up through the earth, right through your bed, and right through your body. So think of that when you're trying to sleep tonight. <laughs> and, um, and so that, you know, the, the weak force is so weak that a neutrino, from the, from, on average, can go through 10,000 light years of lead without interacting once. Okay, and so the electromagnetic force obviously isn't so weak, it's responsible for us being able to see. But it was recognized that these two forces could be understood as different manifestations of the same thing, which is really surprising and, um, and, and unusual. But another very important characteristic of, of science, uh, I I, f I forget where I first heard this described. I certainly know Richard Feynman did, but I think I, I heard it earlier. It might have been Jacob Bernowski. Uh, that one of the hallmarks of progress in science is seeing the things which on the surface seem very different 
are really different manifestations of the same thing. And of course, again, when I look at Richard, I think of evolution in, in, in that sense as well. One of the great beauties of, of Darwinian evolution is the realization that this incredible diversity of life can come from the simple beginning. It's really manifestations of the same basic biology. And so these two very different uh, realms of the universe were recognized as saying, well, the, the mathematics can describe them as being the same, but there's a clear difference. Electromagnetism has, is long range, weak force is short range. Well, in physics, we understand that because uh, the electromagnetism is mediated by particles called photons, the same things that we see. They have no mass, and that's the reason electromagnetism is long range, because the way the force works is I spontaneously create a photon here, and it heads all the way over there and gets absorbed. Now, if it had mass, when I created it here, it would, it would take energy, and it would violate energy conservation. So quantum mechanics says, as I often say, quantum mechanics says it's like the White House or corporate America. <laughs> if, um, if you can't see it, anything goes. And, uh, and, and, and in, in quantum mechanics, uh, so if, if, I, if I violate energy conservation, as long as I do it for a little while, so short a time that I can't see it, then it's fine. So if the particle disappears again, no problem. That's called the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. But So if it's a massless particle, it can take very little energy, and therefore it can last a very long time before you'd notice the violation of energy conservation, and that's why electromagnetism is long range. But the weak force is propagated by particles that are very heavy. And that's why it has a very short range, because when they get popped out, they have to disappear very quickly. So that was predicted and, and known in some sense. And, um, but the problem is then, how could they be manifestations of the same thing? Well, maybe, maybe they're both massless. The particles that convey the weak force and electromagnetism are both massless at some fundamental level. Well, that's crazy because they, they behave very differently. But maybe, and this is the amazing leap of the human imagination and the hubris that, is, that in some sense is, is physics at the modern time, maybe it's an accident of our existence. Maybe there's a, there's a background field throughout all of nature. And what happens is that the particles that convey the weak force interact with that field, and it's like, as I often say, swimming through molasses. As they, as they interact with that background field, they experience resistance, and they begin to act like they're more massive. If you push your car, if your car runs out of gas and you push it on the road, you can get it going. But when it goes off the road and hits the mud, it stops, it feels heavier. So it's like there's this cosmic mud everywhere, and the particles that convey the weak force experience that mud, and the, and the particles that convey electromagnetism don't. Well, that's beautiful. That's a nice story, like a biblical story. <laughs> and if that were the story, if that were the way science were, it would just be, no, it would just be like religion. But the, if there's that mud, quantum mechanics says if there's, that, if there's a field throughout space, if you slap that field hard enough at a single point, really hard at a single point, you'll kick out particles. That's what quantum mechanics tells us. So there's a prediction. So we just have to build a machine that slaps empty space hard enough at a single point and, and will maybe produce the particles associated with that field, the field's called the Higgs field, and those particles. And so the, one of the purposes of the Large Hadron Collider was to, was to uh, discover those particles by slapping empty space hard enough. It's really a kind of a S&M machine. And, um, <laughs> and uh, uh, I, didn't, I was sure they wouldn't see them. It just seemed like such a slimy, simple explanation. It seemed too good to be true to me. And I, that's why I was so surprised that it actually, that explanation is actually true. These particles exist. Now, for me, to answer your question finally, after a little, little bit of physics, uh, this, the idea that these fundamental scalar particles can exist changes for me the entire picture of trying to understand fundamental physics. And I've been thinking lately a lot about the implications that that may have for the dark energy that, that, that governs the universe. It, it opens up for me a whole range of explanations before that I hadn't considered because I just thought the Higgs explanation was just too simple. And nature always surprises us. And this, you know, it just seemed crazy that we would guess the simplest answer and it worked out. Uh, and so I guess I was surprised as I am by being surprised. So that's a short answer to your question. Yeah? What do you think of uh, Jason Lyle who says that we should be seeing a lot of stars uh, being born in the 
and a lot of stars dying, you know, a lot more than we are seeing today. And he says that's proof that, you know, the Big Bang is not true and all those things are wrong. Well, I guess the, the, the evidence of the fact that I don't know who he is suggests that, <laughs> suggests that I don't think much of what he talks about, I guess. Um, um, maybe that's the only way I can put it, I guess, okay. I mean, it's obviously he's had no impact. I, 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 you know, I, I don't want to seem, well, I guess I don't mind seeming pretentious, it's fine. Um, uh, but, but, you know, you just, it, you know what people, I know of people whose work has an impact on my work. And, I, and if it doesn't have an impact on my work and all of my colleagues, then I don't know about them. But uh, look, there are, the, the important thing to, but, but let me be a little less facetious. There are lots of mysteries and there are lots of puzzles. And so when we measure things, we often see things that don't agree with our, with our ideas. But that's the, that's the hallmark of science that's at the forefront. When you're tentatively looking at things, often you see stuff that doesn't seem to fit. Most often, most often the anomalies are wrong. And, and, and in fact, we have to be, this is probably more important for this group. The easiest person to fool is yourself. And so we have to be on guard, not just about others, but our, we have to be skeptical of ourselves. That's probably the most important aspect of skepticism that I think I can convey. Is it? And, and, and that's a particularly important for scientists. Because if you're measuring something and you find something strange, the, simple, the e most immediate response is, I've discovered something important. It's significant. And what you have to do as a scientist, again, as Feynman said, is you have to work equally hard to prove yourself wrong. So, right, you have to, pr most likely, you're making a mistake. And it's very, very difficult if you discovered something potentially wonderful, potentially earth-shattering, that something can make you famous, to, be, to have the courage, the intellectual courage, to say, it's probably wrong, let me figure out what I'm doing wrong. And so it's, very, it's, it's a really important process that experimental scientists, and to some extent theoretical scientists, but since we just I'm a theorist, we just talk, it's easier. Experimentalists actually do things. And um, to, 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 sec to check your work and to try and prove yourself wrong. And, and then if you don't, your colleagues might. And so these, there are many times that since I've been a scientist when, for example, dark, I li like to say, I'm sure, I was sure dark matter was real because it had been, died and been reborn so many times. And, you know, and, 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 and uh, you know, all, everything that's real has been reborn, as we know, has been now. Uh, but, um, in any case, it, it, because there, there's so many times that you, you think something, some implication of your theory implies that. There are too many stars, there are too much clustering. And then what you find is when you look at things more carefully, that's really not an implication. So, so people who claim that everything is wrong are generally wrong. Uh, and the reason is the Big Bang, you know, it, it, that's the other thing. When, you, when I hear someone say, look, this doesn't agree, and therefore everything is wrong, that's just not the way science progresses. Science is based on a huge amount of experimental data. And the hallmark of progress is not to show everything's wrong. Einstein didn't show everything was wrong. In fact, Einstein did exactly the opposite. Einstein showed everything was right. What there was was two theories, one, one of Maxwell, theory of electromagnetism, and one of, of um, Galileo, that when you're moving at a constant rate, rate, you continue to move, and you can't really tell whether you're moving or not. All of you have had the experience of if trains in Canada are smooth, of being in a train station and, and, and looking at the train next to you and it was moving, and you didn't know whether you were moving or it was moving out of the station. Well, it turns out those two things are both right. They're both obviously true because they're both satisfied by the test of experiment, but they're incompatible. So what Einstein did said is, no, I'm not going to throw out those things that are right. I'm going to show how those apparently incompatible things can be compatible, and it turned out the way to make them compatible was to show that time and space are relative, an amazingly brave thing. So I get hundreds of letters, well, not, I get tens of letters every week <laughs> about it, with theories of the universe explaining how everything we know is wrong. And the minute someone says that, I know that I can, if I wanted, if I was like, I think, Lord Kelvin, who used to read, in the old days before they came in as emails, they used to be hard paper. And, one of my favorite responses to those crackpot letters was his when he said, I'm, I'm sitting in the smallest room of my house. Your letter is currently in front of me. Soon it will be behind me. <laughs> okay, maybe one or two more, but we've got to go one more. Yeah. Uh, I was in a room where Freeman Dyson took the side of religion in the science versus religion debate. And I wondered, um, you know, what do you think about that? Is physics generally a safer haven? Well, 
I want to, you know, the key point to, uh, I mean, Freeman just likes to be contrary. Freeman's a good friend, but he, he generally disagrees with whatever everyone else agrees with. It's just his property of him. And I think part of his, I, I read when he won the Templeton Prize, I thought, great, this is a chance for them to really be told off because I respect Freeman greatly as an intellect. And I was very disappointed um, to see that he was so friendly. Um, his, one of his kids is a minister, in fact. But, but, um, but the point is that the thing about science that people don't realize is that, as, as Steve Weinberg, who is an atheist, a uh, Nobel Prize winning physicist, has said, most scientists don't think enough about God to even know if they're atheists. God is just irrelevant. It, it's, so it's not as if physics or biology are one or more, or more safe than the other. God doesn't enter into it ever in any scientific meeting, in any subject of science. God is irrelevant. And so it's the same everywhere. And maybe I, I think I have to go. I'm really sorry. I wish I could stay with you longer. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I've been asked to say a few words about the religious and secular landscape in Canada, um, just so that both of our guests, but uh, in particular our remaining guest, Professor Dawkins, has a bit of context uh, while he's in town. Uh, he doesn't get the opportunity to be in Canada very often, and uh, he and his staff have asked that we share a little bit of the insights about some of the concerns we have here in our home country. So I will invite you to compliment my remarks by adding your own uh, during, our, during our discussion period. I think right off the bat, I should make it clear that Canada has a very strong reputation as a liberal, scientific, and forward-thinking country. It was the third country to legalize gay marriage, and of course our new premier is an openly gay woman. Our charter guarantees freedom of thought, freedom of opinion, and freedom of expression, and it is very rare to see the religious right taken very seriously here in Canada. But much of this may be the veneer of Canadian politeness and political correctness at least according to Canadian journalist Marcy MacDonald, who wrote a book called The Armageddon Factor, The Rise of, Can of Christian Nationalism in Canada. MacDonald, who actually spoke at the inaugural event for our capital branch in Ottawa, argues that through political appointments, manipulation of the judiciary, and other actions both symbolic and substantive, our current federal government is seeking a long-term shift towards American-style religious ideology. In March of 2009, in a now rather infamous example of, of uh, her remarks, a conservative member of parliament, Gary Goodyear, refused to answer a journalist's question about whether he believed in evolution. Instead stated, I am a Christian, and I don't think anybody asking a question about my religion is appropriate. This might be laughable coming from your average politician, but Gary Goodyear is not your average politician. Gary Goodyear is Minister of State for Science and Technology, a cabinet position he continues to enjoy. Flash forward to February of this year, when our government launched, in a mosque, the Office of Religious Freedom. The office is headed by Andrew Bennett, who is a dean at a Christian arts college housed in a church in Ottawa. In writings on his university's website, Bennett, our new ambassador for religious freedom, has described Europe as suffering from secular fundamentalism, and then went on to argue that the greatest genocides in history have been perpetrated in the name of secular ideologies. Our government opted to close the existing International Center for Human Rights and Democracy and instead appoint a Christian apologist to open an office that many fear will provide benefit mainly to Christian lobby groups. I suppose we should wait and see. While south of the border, the mixing of public funds with public schools would be unthinkable, here in Ontario, as all of us in this room are well aware, we fully fund a Roman Catholic school system. While many other provinces provide public subsidies, sometimes as large as 60 to 70 percent, to fund private faith schools, including in Alberta, private evangelical schools that we know teach creationism. Government support for religion in Ontario's Catholic system has regularly pitted basic human rights against archaic religious privilege. Within the last decade, Catholic schools have banned atheist books, such as the novel by Philip Pullman, The Golden Compass. They've suspended a student for wearing the word pro-choice on her shirt. They fired teachers for getting a divorce. They violated the Charter of Rights and Freedoms by prohibiting the establishment of gay-straight student groups in their schools. And of course, they continue to exercise 
their so-called right to block non-Catholics from attending or teaching in these taxpayer-funded schools. In separate but equally concerning developments, government scientists in Canada have recently been prohibited from speaking directly to the media about their work, particularly in the area of climate change. The Canadian government has come under increasing pressure from science advocacy groups such as the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the Royal Society of Canada, and Democracy Watch to reverse these policies but have consistently failed to heed their advice. Suffice it to say, we need all of your help. We're building a structure that will ensure a long-term institution to fight for secularism and science here in Canada, but we can't build that without you. We're excited to announce the launch of our Donor Circle program, a circle of friends committed to our shared vision for a country where church-state separation and evidence-based public policy is front and center. Donor Circle members will be at the forefront and at the front lines of CFI. You'll join us at focus group sessions to discuss new programs. You'll come out to brunch with members of our board. You'll be solicited for feedback on a regular basis. And you'll work with us to host special networking events as we seek to enlarge this circle. The Donor Circle program is available exclusively to members of the Center for Inquiry who support our shared passion through a monthly contribution of at least $25 a month. There will be enhanced levels with added benefits. I'm hoping that each of you will join our circle, and so I want to be candid with you for a moment to you, our key supporters. Many of you have watched with pride, as I have, as our organization has grown and matured. We've seen CFI establish itself as a key voice in the media, as a regular host to some of the largest free thought events in the country, and as a provider of key social and community services. But without a solid foundation, this may not sustain itself, nor provide a platform for real long-term positive change in our country. You've seen what we can do. We, we're asking you to give us the resources to continue to do this important work and to even expand upon it. A monthly donation on an ongoing basis is the single best way to guarantee the continued growth of the CFI. CFI is always busy. Tomorrow we're going to be joining an international protest against the arrest and persecution of Bangladeshi atheists and freethinkers. I'm sure many of you have heard about this, uh, this tragedy that's happening in Bangladesh. We'll be at a public demonstration at nearby Young and Dundas. And if you'd like more details, please come talk to me. I hope to see many of you there tomorrow. There's a lot of work we have to do, and we're committed to that. If you need some inspiration, that's my transition to introducing our speaker, Professor Richard Dawkins, who along with our other distinguished guest who had to leave us, Professor Lawrence Krauss, I think offer us a great deal of inspiration to continue with these important fights. Richard Dawkins was professor for the public understanding of science at the University of Oxford from 1995 until 2008. He's the author of many, many exceptional books, The Selfish Gene, The Ancestor's Tale, The God Delusion. He has received a great number of honorary doctorates, distinctions, and awards in fields ranging from literature to science. You probably know his bio about as well as I do, but did you know that he's recently had a genus of fish named after him? <laughs> the Dawkinsia was awarded to Richard Dawkins for, quote, helping us understand that the universe is far more beautiful and awe-inspiring than any that religion could have imagined. And I think that's a really apt way to describe Richard Dawkins' commitment to fostering science education and defending atheism and non-belief. Please help me welcome Professor Richard Dawkins. Well, thank you very much. I, I was very disturbed to hear uh, Mr. Trottier's account of what's going on in Canada at the moment. I didn't know about that. Uh, and I, um, I applaud what the CFI in Canada is doing. Uh, let me know if I can help in any way. Uh, I listened at attentively to, to Lawrence's comments and was very amused, as, as everybody else was. Um, at the, uh, uh, on the TVO broadcast yesterday, I was somewhat amused in a sort of backhanded way by the way the anchor described Lawrence as the funny, nice one. <laughs> Um, I, I, I was also amused to be reminded of um, when he talked about um, spirituality and Stephen Hawking. Um, I was once at a literary festival in Britain, 
and Stephen Hawking was there, and um, I listened to his talk before mine. And as you know, he, he can't um, uh, speak, and so he has to do it through a computer. It takes a long time to build up his words. So he can't really answer questions, but um, he gets questions sent in in advance, and then uh, his computer answers them. Um, but they did allow one impromptu question from the, from the audience. And a man stood up and said, Professor Hawking, I wonder whether you feel that there's a spiritual dimension to the universe, whether there are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamt of in your materialist philosophy, Horatio. Went on and on and on about <laughs> mystical things, and don't you feel that there's a, 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 a mystical spiritual dimension? He went on. And then Stephen then spent about 10 minutes composing his answer. And we all waited with bated breath for the answer to this question. And finally, it came. No. <laughs> I also, uh, when Lawrence was talking about the Higgs boson, um, I, of course, didn't understand what he was saying any more than any of you did. Um, but I'm, I am very deeply moved by what's going on in modern physics. And I, I visited the Large Hadron Collider on two occasions, and I think on both occasions, it's fair to say that I was pretty much moved to tears by the, uh, the feeling that this gigantic enterprise put together by a group of people from all over the world speaking dozens of different languages, uh, all aimed at understanding the very basis of the universe in which we live, and I really was moved to tears by that, and I tried to convey some of that in one of my books, The Greatest Show on Earth, uh, tried to convey my feeling of poetic humility and uh, being so moved by the Large Hadron Collider. Unfortunately, it all fell rather flat because there was a, a, a misprint in the, in the book. Nobody's ahead of me. Large Hardon Collider. <laughs> Um, I was shocked by some of the things that Mr. Trottier told us about. Uh, in particular, I think the Minister of Science, who when asked for his views on evolution, protested that it was no business of anybody else what his religious views were. I mean, that's pretty shocking coming from, was it the Minister of Science? Yes. Um, I have not come prepared to make a speech. I, have, I said that all I could do was answer questions. I'm very happy to answer questions from from anybody. Uh, yes, over there. Uh, I'm a magician by trade, and I get the how did you do that question often. And so I see lots of superficial curiosity, but no one ever following through to do the research or to think about it seriously to actually figure out how any of it was actually done. They say, how did you do that? But their curiosity is being bounded by something and either as a teacher or, or a biologist. Uh, do you have any thoughts about what that something might be, where did it come from, and how do we get rid of it? I'm actually very, very interested in your profession. I think it has rather, rather important, almost philosophical implications. I prefer not to use the word magician because people confuse that with the sort of supernatural magic which you get in fairy tales. So I, I like to use the word conjurer instead. Um, it, I, mean, I, do, I do think it's, it, it's interesting the way uh, what, what people in your profession do is so uncanny and, and so beyond uh, the comprehension of, of, of even those of us who know that it's only a trick. And so it ought to serve as a kind of cautionary tale uh, in skepticism for when we are told stories of, of miracles that people believe to be supernatural. Uh, when you see what can be done by a really skilled conjurer, uh, you ought never to be fooled by something that appears to be uh, to be uh, supernatural, and many people are. Um, I think you're probably right that the curiosity people show is, is rather superficial. Um, I recall with really deep shame my own lack of curiosity when, as an adult, I forget how old, but I certainly wasn't a child, I saw a trick being performed on television, and it was a man, a near-naked man, um, with a fish hook through his back, in the skin of his back, and a, and a bit of string tied to a railway truck. And he was uh, purported to be pulling this railway truck with this little bit of string 
um, tied to a fish hook in his back. And my reaction then, and I blush as I say to say this, was to feel that probably is supernatural. I mean, how could I, how could I be so stupid as to think that an obvious violation of the laws of physics was actually going on before my eyes? Having seen conjurers, this wasn't even a very clever conjuring trick. I mean, I'm sure it was just rather ele elementary to somebody like you. Um, so I sort of feel, and nowadays I take rather pride in my skeptical outlook on, on the world, but I sort of feel, well, if I could be fooled by such a stupid trick as that, uh, I should be more sympathetic towards others who, who tend to be lulled uh, into gullibility. Uh, yes. Yes. Oh, I'm, I'm also a magician, I would say, perhaps, or a thought to be one, because I'm entitled to use the title reverend. And so uh, within the religious community, we are often thought that we can do supernatural things. Um, however, I'm privileged and humbled to be able to lead a community that is comprised predominantly of atheists and free thinkers and those who would issue any label, and indeed uh, would accept any of those labels myself. My concern is, and I'm wondering what your perspective is on the fact that um, within religious community, for good or for ill, uh, communities have been able to establish an ethic, uh, a system of morality by which they are able to be in common discourse with one another. And as we lose churches uh, for because we're failing to transition them, as I have been able to do with mine, at any rate that would suggest any kind of survival, um, we're losing that place where we can create that uh, safe space for, for civil discourse to then inform civic discourse. And so have the conversations that we need to have with Lawrence around you know, where, where is the ethical boundary uh, to science? Is there one? Should we establish one? Should we have a rubric? And if we did, would we hold to it? And those kinds of conversations. And so that we can have the conversation about how religion is influencing <coughs> politics. Um, so we're losing a lot of that because as people race from religion, they end up so often in isolation. And so those conversations don't take place. How can we counter that? It's tragic, I think, that uh, the ethical discussion, ethical discourse that we need to have in society has for centuries been hijacked by religion, by, a, by what amounts to a pseudo-scientific worldview, has absolutely nothing to do with entitlement to talk about ethics. Um, so we need to, one way in which I put it, I think I put it like this in the Melbourne Atheist Conference last year, is we need to take back the idea of intelligent design. We need intelligent design. Intelligent design of our morals, intelligent design of our ethics, intelligent design of our society. We need to sit down together as rational beings, scientific beings, and decide, talk about, discuss, argue about, wonder about the sort of society in which we want to live, the sort of morals we want to obey, the sort of ethics uh, we want to uphold. Intelligently design that uh, rather than get it from some Bronze Age barbaric text. Um, I think that anybody who actually reads the Bible or the Quran would be totally horrified at the thought that anybody could get their morals from there. So we've got to get it from somewhere else, and we clearly do get it from somewhere else, because if you look at the social mores, the ethics, the morals that people have over historical time, they are labeled by the time in which they are talked about, not, by the, not so much by the uh, religious background of the people talking. When we today whether we're religious or not, are 21st century citizens. And our morals and our ethics and our, our views of how to live are 21st century views. Some are a bit ahead of the curve, some are a bit, a bit behind. But we are, however far ahead or behind the 21st century curve we are, we are unmistakably all 21st century people, different from 19th century or, or 16th century people. Um, if you look at the 19th century, even people in the vanguard of moral and political thought, like T.H. Huxley, like Charles Darwin, uh, Abraham Lincoln, their views today would shock us. They're racist, they're non-progressive, they're sexist. Um, we have moved on, we've all moved on. 
so that there is something, I've called it the shifting moral zeitgeist, there's something that moves on from century to century, and it owes nothing or almost nothing to religion. So clearly we're getting it from somewhere else. And it seems to me that we should try to intelligently design where it comes from and uh, write down what it is that, we've, that we feel is, is right and, and what we feel is wrong. It doesn't come from scripture. It doesn't or shouldn't come from fear of punishment uh, and hope of reward. It should come from an honest, altruistic, socially conscious discussion of the kind of society in which we all feel we would like to live. And I, I think that we, we in the atheist com community need to take a lead in that, having thrown away the biblical, the scriptural, uh, and the, what should we call it, the moral blackmail uh, origins of, of morality and intelligently design um, our morality in socially altruistic ways. I think that you were next, Jessica. What do you think about um, the current wave of radicalism in the Middle East and North Africa and the future of it and how it would uh, affect political and religious structure in the United States? I don't know as much about this as I suspect you do. Um, like many people, I, have, I had been encouraged by the so-called Arab Spring, the, the wave of, of revolution that seemed to be spreading through the, through the Middle East, the overthrowing of uh, previously um, tyrannical dictatorships, and disappointed that this, this idealistic, as, as I had thought, movement seemed to be being hijacked by Islam. Uh, and I, I don't know what to suggest about that. I would think you probably have more ideas than I do about that. Um, I think it's very sad, uh, and I would like to think of, we, we should all think about ways in which we could try to help. Uh, rationalist thinking colleagues in those countries to, uh, to, to, to take back the idealism of that, of that movement. Well, what do you think the radicalism in that part of the world would help people like Rick Center um, and Sarah Palin and all those people, extremists and... Um, well, there does seem to be a kind of unholy alliance between the nut jobs in especially the United States. Um, they, don't, they wouldn't recognize that, of course, but, but, but there is a, a distinct similarity between them. Yeah. Uh, yes, Larry. I'm interested in the evolution creation debate, as you, as you probably know, uh, and I've been following your activities in Great Britain. Do you think creationism is becoming more, more of a threat in Great Britain than, than it used to be? It's interesting. Um, unlike in America, uh, where, and I think that includes Canada, where the, the impetus comes from radical Christianity, from fundamentalist Christianity, in Britain it more comes from Islam. And uh, my colleague, uh, Steve Jones, um, lecturing in genetics in University College London to medical students, has Islamic medical students walking out of his lectures because he's lecturing ab about evolution. And I hear this over and over again from uh, school children, school teachers in Britain. Uh, for a television program for Channel 4, I visited one of Britain's leading Islamic schools, and I'm sorry to say that in Britain we do have government-supported religious schools, uh, one of Britain's leading Islamic schools, and I talked on television to half a dozen girls. The girls and boys are kept separate, of course. Half a dozen girls, and every single one of them uh, was a young earth creationist, as was their teacher, uh, and they were proud of it, and the teacher told me that everybody in the school was a creationist, and they were proud of it. They felt that um, the Quran was a leading scientific textbook. They've, they explicitly said that if there was a conflict between what the Quran said and what science said, they would go with the Quran. Um, this um, I find very up upsetting, uh, and it is a, a growing tendency in Britain I'm not quite sure what's feeding it. I suspect it may be a kind of political resentment against what's felt to be um, a political neo-colonialist attitude of um, perhaps they feel it's fueled by racism. There's a kind of loyalty thing, that loyalty to Islam means you have to believe this, this nonsense which contradicts, uh, contradicts everything that science is telling, is telling us. 
I think it's very disturbing, very upsetting. I wish I knew what we could do about it. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, what do you think of people like Michael Behe, who have uh, their arguments, you know, bashed again and again, and yet they keep coming back with the same stupid arguments? And, uh, you know, is it because they're too stupid to understand what they've been told, or is it because they feel like lying? You know, are they lying for Jesus? What do you think? I don't think I should try to get into the mind of Michael Behe. Um, I, I don't know whether he's dishonest or stupid. Um, he's been publicly disowned by his own department uh, in, what is it, Lehigh Valley uh, in, in Pennsylvania. Um, he's, he goes on, as you say, he gets, of course, enormous encouragement. I mean, he's a poster boy for creationists, even though actually he's, I mean, he believes in what he calls intelligent design and specified complexity. But, uh, I mean, he, he believes in evolution. I mean, I, the, the creationists who make him their poster boy kind of rather gloss over that, that fact. It's just that he believes in evolution with God helping it over the difficult jumps. Um, but. He, nevertheless, he's a, he's a kind of rock star of the creationist movement. And I guess that, that may seem flattering. I don't know. I mean, I would have thought he would have, any decent scientist would have preferred to look for the respect of his scientific colleagues. But, uh, but I, it, whatever else he's doing, he's not doing that. <coughs> yes. I'm a psychotherapist, and I get a lot of pushback, not only from colleagues, but my association about when you deal with a, a client who is going through some guilt or other issues that is related to religion, either you're supposed to util, uh, work within their belief system and, or get around it, but not to attack religion and that sense of rationality. And I was wondering about Britain, how they handle it or are you aware of it or how I could create more change within the field. I don't know uh, what the um, what shrinks, let's just say, for, for, for <laughs> generalize, um, are taught to do. I mean, I could. I, I know. Th I know that um, my my ex-wife um, is a Samaritan who deals with um, distressed people phoning in, threatening suicide, and they are told in no uncertain terms in their training: Samaritans don't preach; they let the person talk, uh, and. I think what you're talking about is something similar, that people in the psychotherapy professions are probably taught not to try to change the views of their, of their, of their, their patients in, in that kind of way. Um, I've met that in teachers as well, uh, teachers who are um, suffering when trying to teach evolution, when children say, you're upsetting my religion, you're, you're the, the teachers have been told, you must not upset their religion. You must go along with their religion, teach them the science, but, but don't tell them that your religion is a load of rubbish. Um, it, I wouldn't tolerate that if I were a teacher. I mean, I, if, I, if I were a teacher, and I suspect if I were a shrink, um, I, would be, I wouldn't be capable of holding my tongue in, in that sort of way. Why should I? Uh, if somebody is talking obvious nonsense, then it, it seems to me would be my duty as an honest person to say so, but then I probably wouldn't last long in, in that profession. So I don't have any advice for you. Um, you know better than I. Yes. Um, sorry. Okay, let's have this one first, okay. Uh, I have a question about um, your current view on why um, seemingly the United, with the United States is such a paradox that the developed nations um, is so religious. And I know that in one of your books, uh, you wrote at one time that, in your view, perhaps it was because there was so much competition between the various choices for religion. Um, whereas in one of his books, uh, Sam Harris, uh, I think, wrote that, uh, in his view, and in the research seems to bear out that where there are chasms in terms of um, uh, social disparity, both income and class and so forth, that's where um, rel religiosity really takes root. And in his view, that was why, I guess, the United States is so religious as an aberration in um, uh, developed nations. And 
Uh, I know it was a while ago since you wrote that in, in, in your book, and I was just wondering like, what your current view is why the United States is so <coughs> religious. Okay, the, the, the question is about the anomalous position of the United States. Uh, in, in Western civilizations in being so much more religious than anywhere else. I don't know where Canada stands on that, by the way. Don't, can anybody tell me? Always Sorry? Always in between Europe. Al always in between, okay. Um, but if you, <laughs> but if you, um, if, if, if you look at, at, at the figures for all sorts of, of in indices of religiosity, it is true that the United States is way off the, off the picture. It's, it, do it doesn't fit in with anything else that you might expect from looking at Western Europe. It's much more in with the Islamic countries. You have to go right over Europe to get any, anything, anything similar. Um, and the questioner uh, mentions two things. Um, she said um, that one, one hypothesis is that because the United States was founded in secularism, uh, the founding fathers were all secularists. They were either deists or, or if, if religious, they kept quiet about it. They didn't feel that it would have anything to do with, 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 with government. Because there is no established church, whereas in Britain, in Scandinavia, uh, there is an established church, in those countries, the established church has seen to it that religion has become boring and tedious and nobody cares about it. It's just what you do when you're born, get married and die. Um, and it's responsible for state ceremonies, state funerals, state weddings and things. But nobody really takes it seriously. Whereas in America, where there is no established church, uh, this freed up religion to become free enterprise, uh, to become big business, to become, um, to use all the slick techniques of advertising. And so you get these mega churches, and I visited one or two of them. Uh, they're, they're very frightening places. The other observation which the questioner made, and I think she probably got it from the work of Gregory Paul, uh, she quoted Sam Harris, but I think it comes from Gregory Paul, um, that if you look worldwide and if you look uh, within the states of the United States, you find a correlation between religiosity and poverty, religiosity and lack of social benefit, social caring. Uh, in those countries and in those states within the United States where there is uh, a lot of social welfare, you get low levels of teenage pregnancy, low levels of abortion, um, and so on, that's where you get the least religion. You get the most religion, where all the indices of social distress uh, are, are, are high. Um, which way the causal arrow goes is open to, uh, to debate, but there does seem to be at least a correlation there. Um, I've heard a third hypothesis about the United States, uh, which is that being a society of immigrants, so many people arrived in the country bereft of their extended family support groups that they left behind, for example, in Europe, and uh, needed some substitute for the sort of grandmother figures and the uncles and aunts and things that provided the support system in extended families. And churches stepped in and provided that. Uh, I, I don't know what I think. There, I've, I've told you about three different hypotheses. There's clearly something odd going on in the United States that leads to, well, the, the remarkable phenomenon that anybody could seriously consider voting for Sarah Palin. I mean, how could you imagine a civilized country in which that, in which that could, could possibly happen? Uh, so there is, there is something odd. Fortunately, um, it's almost as though I think the United States is dividing into two species. I mean, there's just, I, I've actually never met anybody who voted for George Bush, I don't think. But, but that just means that I don't mix with, the, with the, those people. By the way, um, a question came up went to Lawrence Krauss about um, whether physics uh, w was more predisposed to religiosity than biology. And um, it is true that Actually, no, that's not really relevant to this question, is it? I'll, I'll, um, y yes. Oh, you, you've had one already, haven't you? Yeah, sorry. Oh, you, oh, you didn't? I beg your pardon. Okay. I'm often intrigued by the decline of science support among the political right, and uh, especially obvious in the last 20 years. So 22 years ago, the Soviet Union collapsed, and until then, there was an external threat to Western society. It was the scientists who had developed new weapons and... Uh, laid the groundwork for prosperity, economic growth. So say in the 1960s, uh, you know, 
scientists were, like the 50, 60 scientists were in the center, at the center of society, and were really important to, uh, uh, in the struggle against the others, against the Soviets. And uh, when the Soviet Union collapsed, that sort of disappeared, uh, and uh, particularly among the, on the right side of the political spectrum. Is there anything that can replace that, that external threat to? Uh, yes. Um, it's interesting that it's, it's, it's a major theme of 1984, isn't it? That, that um, the, 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 the ruling dictatorship, the, the ruling party in 1984 had to have an external threat uh, in order to motivate people. And um, so there was a more or less fictitious permanent war going on between the three great powers. And there, then there was the, the great public enemy. Um, I forget his name, Gold, Goldstein, no. I, f I forget his name, but they, but but they but there had to be a public enemy, um, and I mean I I take it are you suggesting that after the collapse of the Soviet Union, um, Islam took it took took over as the sort of bogeyman? Is that what you're what you're leading towards? I see more the lack of that external threat, and uh, this is more for the, the political right that kind of needs this threat. It's, it's not so much the left side of the spectrum that seems to be motivated, motivated by that. Yes. Well, I, it's an observation. I, I take your observation, and I think it's interesting. I've, I have no real comment on it. Um, yes. Yeah, um, there's a saying that says, you know, bad ideas don't die. The people who have bad ideas die. Um, and and I, I kind of was thinking about that in regards to, like, evolution. They don't really die. They become the junk DNA of our past. Right? Uh, we're aware of these ideas and we dismiss them as being stupid or idiotic. Um, and, you know, do you see a point where, like, obviously, 19th century, I think somewhere in the book was saying about Newton was a Christian, but then, of course, everybody was back then. And now we don't have, you know, that happening anymore that Christianity, Catholicism, religion in general is becoming part of our junk DNA. Uh, but how many generations do we have to wait before we finally leave that to the fish tales of, of our of our genetic past or our theoretical, you know, intellectual past? Needless to say, I look forward to that day. It's co it's coming, it's coming more slowly than I would have thought. Uh, but I mean, it is it is coming, and the broad sweep of history is, is going in the right direction. But it's a kind of sawtooth rather than a steady decline, uh, and. I think you can expect that when something is in its death throes, it tends to lash out. And so we can expect to see some of that before it really does become junk DNA. Um, I, many of you have probably seen that great Canadian Steve Pinker's latest book, The Better Angels of Our Nature, um, where looking at the at, at history in the very long term, um, all the indices that he looks at very systematically seem to be moving in the, in the right direction. But it, it is a, sl a slow process. Yes. So I, w I went to rabbinical college in the 90s, and I never totally got over the foundational myth of Judaism, that it was a revelation experienced by my ancestors. How could a nation have accepted a lie that was supposed to have happened to themselves? Do you understand the question? Most myths happen to some dude, and he spread the word. But Jews believed it happened to them, themselves. Or Grandpa told me it happened to him. Uh, I'm, I'm not quite sure I get the point. I, I, how, how did a national myth begin? Yes. They all believed it happened to themselves. I met this. Uh, I, I actually had a very nice dinner. I was invited to dinner. My wife and I invited to dinner by the chief rabbi in, in uh, Britain um, with about 15 other people. We were the only non-Jews there. And it soon became clear that they all bought into the idea of specialness. Uh, of, Ju of Jews, and one of the most impressive things I was told, and I think it's true, is that there is a quite astonishing mismatch between the proportion of Jews in the world and the number who have won Nobel Prizes. Um, I mean, it is just a quite staggering uh, mi mismatch. That's something like less than 1% of people in the world are Jews, and something like more than 20% of Nobel Prizes have been won by by, by Jews, so there's a certain amount of empirical support for <laughs> for, um, for uh, specialness, and, and I tell you that story because it impressed me. 
Uh, but I didn't. I still don't think I quite understand the question. The question is, the ancient Israelites believed that they personally experienced God's revelation. It wasn't like Moses was one guy saying, hey, guess what happened to me? You know, everyone went through the desert. Everyone walked through the Red Sea. And then they told their kids, and their kids told their kids all the way to 2013. Yes. Um, so how did they all come to believe it happened to themselves? How, wouldn't some guy say, that didn't happen to me. I didn't go through the desert. Well, My dad but I mean... Well, of course they didn't. They thought their ancestors did. But, um, the first generation had to think it happened to them, or dad happened to dad. Well, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't even know whether it's whether that's different from, from the myths of the ancient Greeks and, and things, is it? I, um, the Greeks talk about Zeus or Hercules, not themselves and their moms and dads. Yeah, OK, I, I, I think I just don't, don't get it. Sorry. Okay. Yes? It's your tombstone, Richard. Oh, oh, what? Oh. Oh, God, I don't know. Um, <laughs> I don't know. That's facetious, obviously. The way that you're I, 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 once, I once was asked to, I once was asked to um, write my own epitaph. It, it, a little bit more than three, three words. I'll see if I can, I can remember it. Others lived beyond his means, a giver, not a taker. He was less selfish than his genes more blind than his watchmaker. <laughs> uh, yes. Yeah. As the author of um, you know, Great Show, I have a question about, I guess, um, the education of the next generation of hopefully, hopefully uh, secular humans. Um, everyone in this room is pretty familiar with the notion that, of the position that uh, humanist movement, science movement, is somehow devoid of something, spirituality or something of that nature. Um, everyone in this room is also familiar with the notion of just tremendous awe we found in the universe. My question, I guess, has to do with in approaching young people, in educating young people, getting them involved in science, do you think that, what, how do you see the role of awe? To me, I think it's, it's somehow at, a little bit at odds with the notion of critical thinking, this sort of poetic emotional response to the wonderful nature of the universe. And yet, I think it's a powerful motivator. Should it go first in our, in our, in our discussions with children to, to get them to become critical thinkers and humanists? Or is it something that should come as a result of, of, that, record, of that understanding? I don't see the conflict between critical thinking and the sort of poetic Carl Sagan-esque response to the universe. I'd like to think they both go together. Um, since I mentioned Carl Sagan, uh, most of his books are evocative of the sort of poetic response to the universe that you're talking about, the pale blue dot and things like that. The Demon Haunted World does too, but the Demon Haunted World very much focuses on the critical aspect. And the, the two seem to me to be joined together in, in, a, in a very happy way. Um, Carl Sagan said, when you're in love, you want to tell the world if you're in love with science, who wouldn't want to tell the, something like that? Who wouldn't, wouldn't want to tell the world about, about science? Um, when talking about education of science with children, I am a little bit at odds with a fashionable view, which is that the best way to treat, teach science is as a, pra a practical subject. So is this microphone popping and make it? Do I, should I just try not to use it at all? Would that be better? Um, there, there is a view that scientific education should be practical, that children should be immediately given a test tube and a Bunsen burner and, and um, told to make bangs and smells and, and things. Um, I do find a bit of a mismatch between that and the Carl Sagan or at the sight of a galaxy approach. And I'm, I'm, I'm for the Carl Sagan approach rather than the Bunsen burner approach. We do need the Bunsen burner approach in order to educate a generation of children who will become practical scientists, and we need to have scientists. But there's an analogy, I think, with music here. You can become a lover of music and a well-informed, educated lover of music, actually quite knowledgeable about music, without ever learning to play an instrument, without having to go through the discipline of five-finger exercises on the piano or violin or something. And I think that perhaps we need to 
understand that you can teach science without a Bunsen burner, that you can teach appreciation of science. And, and students who are not becoming specialist scientists do need to have science appreciation courses which open their eyes to the wonder and the glory of the world in which they live, the universe in which they live, as seen through the eyes of science. I suspect that some of those people at present are rather put off by the fact that in a science class, the first thing, or almost the last thing they meet is a Bunsen burner. Uh, yes. Science question, epigenetics. Oh, not right. the epigenetics question. No, no, no. no. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I beg your pardon. I'm just so bored with epigenetics. I recently rewatched your interview with uh, the creationist Wendy Wright. And uh, I was wondering if you made any special preparations like, uh, like Zen meditation before you did because your patience was superhuman. Yeah. I don't know how many of you have seen this. It, it does seem to, it comes up on Twitter a lot. It seems to be, um, I, I, I've never tweeted it, but obviously somebody has. Um, so how many people have seen this? this? Oh, God, everybody's seen it. Right? Um, any preparation? Yes, um, the director, who's a very wise, sympathetic man, said, you must not lose your temper. <laughs> you must keep calm. <laughs> you must be polite. And so I was going into it, I must be polite, I must be polite. I mustn't lose my temper. Um, and... Well, I like to think I succeeded. I mean, it was, show me the evidence, show me the evidence, show me the evidence. <laughs> yeah. Another uh, trivial question. Uh, many public intellectuals in Britain uh, have accepted knighthoods. If you were offered a knighthood or the Order of Merit or something, would you accept it, and why or why not? Yes, I think I would. I mean, <laughs> um, I'm, I shall make no further comment. <laughs> yes. Um, when debating for atheism, uh, what do you think is the best way to bring together human morality and science together? Human morality and science. Like and science. Um, I don't think I'd go as far as Sam Harris, who's written in the moral landscape that he thinks that science can more or less tell us what's, what's moral, but I think he's got some, he makes some very good points. Um, I do think that secular moral philosophy uh, is what should inform our moral discussions, and this is a scientific way of thinking about moral questions. I don't think that science can tell you ultimately what your criterion for right and wrong should be, but I think what it can do, which is what secular moral philosophy does, is to point out when you are confused, when you're making contradictions that you hadn't realized, when one part of your belief system is incompatible with another part of your belief system. Uh, I think a scientifically informed way of looking at morals would probably downplay the sheer yuck reaction. For example, um, suppose we took the morality of eating meat and uh, we might inform our discussion by thinking evolutionarily about the, um, about the reason why we, we make a distinction between cannibalism and eating other mammals. There are no doubt good reasons for making that distinction, but at least it's not an obvious distinction. It's not something where we should immediately say, cannibalism, yuck, eating beef, fine. We've, what we ought to at least think about what the distinction is. When Lawrence Krauss was uh, having a debate with some Muslim spokesman in London, he mentioned, I think, briefly this morning, um, and... Uh, he was, this Muslim spokesman, as it were, put him on the spot by saying, what's wrong with incest? And Lawrence very sensibly said, well, I'm not sure that I, there is that much wrong with incest, really. I mean, if there's no danger of children being born, he sort of went through all the reasons why one might be against incest. 
Um, and then he said that you need to come up with some sort of a reason why incest would be wrong. The Muslim audience was horrified. I mean, they, were, they sort of gasped that, that, anybody, that, that anybody should, should consider the question in a sort of rational way. Um, suppose that it, on, on sort of Peter Singer type um, uh, animal liberation grounds, we decided we didn't want to eat, we didn't want to kill an animals, but we did um, uh, want to use tissue culture of animal tissue, of say muscle, muscle tissue, so that there's no killing, no distress, no suffering. We tissue culture fake beef, actually get cow muscle cells and, 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 and tissue culture that make, make steak. Um, many people would have a sort of yuck reaction to that, but not so much as if you said, well, what if you did that for human muscle? Tissue culture cannibalism. Again, many people would immediately have a yuck reaction to that. Cannibalism, horrors. And yet, if you actually step back and think about the morality of it, nobody's hurt, nobody's being, being distressed, nobody's being killed. But we've got this kind of um, atavistic horror of the idea of cannibalism. So I think that um, a scientific way of thinking about morals can get us to, to think in, in more adventurous, more imaginative ways. Um, there are slippery slope arguments, which I'm not so scornful of as some other people are. I think that, um, that uh, you have to be alive to slippery slope problems. For example, if it was suggested that we, although we shouldn't kill humans to eat them, what about road kills? Uh, the person is already dead. Um, <laughs> I would be against that, <laughs> but it, it, it is important to say why, and, and in, in my case, I think it probably would be a, a slippery slope arg argument. We've got a taboo against cannibalism, which is probably a wise thing to have. Then there's the consideration that the relatives of the deceased might be distressed. <laughs> so, okay, I've probably talked enough about that. <laughs> I think we, we've had one from one, one, one other. Oh, yes. Yeah, oh, um, sorry. Oh, two more questions. Um, yes. We're very grateful for your public life, and uh, just uh, any comments on if you c plan to continue and for how long, or uh, what are your you, plans sorry. for the future? Go a bit louder. Plans for the future, Richard. Plans for the future, and your specifically your public life. Oh, plans for the future. Um, well, I I've slightly abashed to admit that I've was persuaded to write an autobiography. And um, I agreed to do it and signed a contract with the British and American publishers who were, who were very keen. Um, and I got a bit daunted by it. And so I, when I got halfway through, I decided to cut it in half and make it into two volumes. And that gave me a wonderful feeling of achievement because I suddenly realized <laughs> I'd already finished volume one. <laughs> <laughs> and. Um, so I took, I took volume one, um, it, indeed it is now in proof, I have the proofs in this hotel, I'm working on them now, um, up as far as finishing my first book, The Selfish Gene, which did mark a kind of natural uh, dividing point in my life. My life did rather take off in a different direction after that, so it's a fairly logical place to stop. The, the other reason, apart from getting this nice warm glowy feeling that I'd achieved something by finishing a book, um, there was another reason for wanting to split it into two. Um, I decided rather early on this was not going to be a kiss and tell autobiography. I was not going to have any of my personal private life in there. And that I think was a very good decision. I'm going to live up to that. But it made the first half of the book, which is largely about childhood, seem a little bit anomalous because you can't write about your own childhood without being personal and intimate. And I felt that if I had been personal in writing about childhood and then suddenly stopped at, and, uh, when, when, when I got to sort of more, more, more adult personal things, um, it would look anomalous and look odd. Dividing it into two volumes with two years between the two volumes kind of makes this natural break. And so that was a highly confidential reason why, why um, I decided to, 
divided into two volumes. But, the, but vol volume one, it, it, I'm not allowed to call it volume one either. It's got to have a, a separate name. Um, the publishers insisted on that. And that's coming out in September 2013. And the second half will be in September 2015, with paperbacks in, in intermediate. Yes. One more question, I think, I'm told. Uh, you've had, I think, of news back there. Uh, just a, a question with your background in evolution and your early adoption of computers. Um, we seem to be locked in like a vicious circle with regards to technology that we keep inventing uh, you know, more uh, faster machines, more complex machines, and our civilization gets more advanced and needs more complex machines to take care of it. Do you foresee this as an expression of evolution that we are uh, essentially transiting, we're, we're essentially doing a job of transiting life from biological to possibly electronic in the future? Yes, this is the sort of science fiction question which I, I am interested in. I mean, I think, I think that it's, it's, it, it's a not unreasonable speculation that uh, in, in some thousands of years' time, there may be a group of silicon beings sitting in a room like this um, speculating about the possibility that way back in the dawn ages there may have been some soft, squashy, um, sort of water-based, carbon-based life form that perhaps gave rise to us uh, before silicon life came along. Um, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a not unreasonable science fiction plot. Um, Yes, they would. <laughs> they would have creationism. That's quite right. Um, but uh, but I think the question was going on. I uh, was asking the possibility that they might evolve, and and it it, it is a a genuinely interesting point that uh, evolution, which I would put my shirt on, pretty much having to be by natural selection, um, if it's going to be if it's going to produce the kind of um, adaptive fit, the kind of illusion of design that, that the living things so spectacularly show, um, that evolution by natural selection doesn't have to be based upon the sort of genetics, the sort of physiology, the partnership between DNA and protein that, that, we, that we know about. Um, there are other, other media in which natural selection could take place and could give rise to the same illusion of design. And computers, technology, software, the internet, could provide the kind of infrastructure which at, in, in life is, is provided by the d DNA, RNA, protein partnership. And once you've got the infrastructure provided by the computer world, um, artificial life could take over in an evolutionarily non-designed way. The computer that, that a run on had to be designed, but the evolution itself could be non-designed. And the uh, research that's been going on in the field of artificial life is just in its embryonic stages at the moment, but, but it, I, I think it, it could, be, could be really big in the, in the future, and, and I won't be around to see it, but it, it could be both exciting and frightening at the same time. Thank you very much. Thank you ever so much, uh, Professor Dawkins, for uh, uh, answering our questions today. I, I, I'm really uh, just blown away to see that you've put the exact same level of, of insight and eloquence and humor into answering our small group's questions as, as I've seen you do on TV for, for millions of people. Um, and I think that we're, we're really um, uh, very, I was about to say blessed, uh, I mean gifted, <laughs> fortunate uh, today uh, to be in this room with you. And thank you so much for, for giving us your time. Um, I just want to mention, uh, um, uh, Professor Dawkins, uh, I'm hoping that I'll get to call you Sir, Professor Dawkins, uh, Sir, Sir Dawkins in a couple years from now. That'd be great. Uh, <laughs> Sir Richard Dawkins. Um, uh, he will be uh, signing books uh, at the close of the presentation. Um, and thank you all for being here with us today. Uh, for the closing remarks, I'm uh, very proud to uh, introduce our uh, chair of the board, uh, Kevin Smith, as well as our vice chair and treasurer, uh, Gary Fitzgibbon, please. Uh, Richard, I want to thank you. It is kind of odd. You get too close to it. I want to thank uh, thank you for being our guest this morning. Uh, and we at CFI Canada appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be with us. 
really appreciate it. I would also like to thank our Toronto branch director, Jamie Warner, and uh, her team of volunteers here in Toronto for organizing this event. Now, on short notice, as Lauren said, the last time I was at a prayer, uh, a breakfast function, was when I attended a national prayer breakfast in Ottawa a few years ago. Uh, I had not flirted with going to the dark side. I was curious to know what these religious types do behind closed doors. There were few, there were few, there weren't any surprises, as it was true to the name prayer breakfast. We ate breakfast, and they prayed and prayed and prayed. I noticed that the Christian organizers invited people of different religions to attend, which I thought was considered an admirable of them. I pictured those who follow Judaism and Islam all praying and eating together with the Christians, one big happy Abrahamic family for a change. However, when my breakfast, um, my breakfast was served, I noticed a heaping pile of pork sausages on the plate. <laughs> I thought perhaps it was a kind of odd sense of evangelical humor. But the prayer breakfast left me with a bad taste in my mouth. Just, it wasn't just me and the greasy sausages. It reminded me that with Canada under the rule of a Christian prime minister, the Christian right in Canada is gaining influence. As mentioned earlier, scientists are being muzzled by the government. Funding is being directed away from secular charities to Christian ones. Many that promote homophobia in places like Uganda. We at CFI Canada make it our business to bring attention to matters like these and to fight for secularist values every day. With your financial support, we can continue to do this. Richard, you do a marvelous job of fighting the same battle south of the border as we do here. High religio religiosity in the US is unique amongst Western countries, and it is important that your voice continues to press for a major secular overhaul there. But we would love to have you visit Canada on a semi-regular basis. We could use your, use your help with an occasional tune-up. So you're welcome anytime. And thank you very much for being here with us. Thank you. And we're going to, if you just want to come to the podium, Richard, we're just going to present you with a. Oh, you have to stand up to get your gift. Oh, yes. You've got to work for it even more. Now, there's, there's two things in the bag. One is maybe a bit odd. But yeah. we. Um, oh, no. Yes, I'm I like the, all the tables. Well, I'm yes. the comic relief here because uh, <laughs> some of you will have read on uh, Professor Dawkins' tweet that he is keen about socks. So we got him Two some, uh, some gray <laughs> socks. Oh, great. oh, thank you. Canadian, uh, a very old Canadian company, but of course the socks were made in China. <laughs> <laughs> the point about the socks is that they shouldn't be paired. They don't have chirality. <laughs> Therefore, you should be able to buy any number of single socks. <laughs> Who hasn't spent hours looking for the other sock? <laughs> the babe wouldn't sell me. Uh, no, they come in pairs, right, but they like right. socks. There's three here. We thought we called the Holy Trinity of socks. <laughs> there are six socks. They're not three pairs not of socks. <laughs> right. Yes, that's right. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> You're welcome. And this is actually a little nicer than socks. Professor okay. Dawkins. Um, Ticking, is it? Anyone has drum roll? There's no ticking, no. <laughs> <laughs> you don't think so. What does it mean? Uh, it's an Anukshuk. Uh, it's an incredibly Canadian artifact that's right. been designed by a uh, Inuit artist. Um, it's one of a kind, and we also have inscribed a special face for you uh, as thanks for coming and, uh, and doing this uh, <coughs> Yes. I'm very touched. Thank you very much indeed. It's a beautiful thing. But uh, d does it actually have a symbolic meaning? Yes. Yeah. 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 Yes. It, it guide, it's a guidepost, essentially. The Inuit would, would, the would put them on the hill so they would see where the next one was. They'd go, then they'd see the next one, and they could find their way home in a white hunt. But that, but that would be a, bi a big one. Yes. <laughs> Think Again TV is produced by Centre for Inquiry, Canada's premier venue for secular humanists, atheists, skeptics, and free thinkers.